As part of Christmas stu uh, study, I wanted to talk about giving. Uh, it's the time for giving gifts. Christ is the great gift. That, he is the gift that keeps on giving, for real, forever and ever. You know, he's definitely the energizer bunny of all gifts. So I want to I wanted talk about how the Bible tells us we should think about giving, not just during this time of year, uh, because there's certainly some disorientation to the plan during the Christmas season where we give out of obligation and uh, uh, so many people give just because somebody's given to them. And though, those are not biblical ideas. And uh, so let's look at our sheet here and we'll talk a little bit about giving. And I've titled it Giving All You Have after the widow's might, which will be about the probably the focus of what we're going to talk about. Now, God is a generous and giving person. He has given everything that he has to us. He wants us to become like him, totally committed, and to dedicate all that we have, all our resources of every kind, to the cause of redeeming a lost world. So the whole issue of giving or serving the Lord, which is giving as a service, is serving the Lord. It's taking what God puts in your hands and using it for his glory to promote his message. Understanding that, you know, when Jesus said, don't lay up treasures on the earth, lay up treasures in heaven, he was trying to help the disciples and those who heard him to understand that the resources God gives us are for our own sustenance and that of our family and yet and, and beyond is to do, it, do ministry work, is to give it to the church and do ministry work with it. So if you lay up treasures in, in, on the earth, you're certainly free to do that. And, and you know, I love America, but I think the great thing about America, uh, one of many things, is our freedom. I don't think that our idea of prosperity is, is based well. I don't think that <laughs> the idea that you're supposed to save up all your money and one day be able to quit and do nothing or go around the world and just play, I don't believe that I can find that in a biblical context. Uh, there's just not there. So we're, we're born again ambassadors, priests for God that are continue on all the way to the end. There's no retirement from being a believer. So let's talk about some patterns of giving. Uh, if you'll turn with me to 1 Chronicles 29, I want to show you David. David wanted to build the temple that Solomon built. He wanted to build it, but God said, no, no, I want Solomon to do it. So he did allow David to put together a big offering as the basis of what's going to build the temple. And in chapter 29, uh, like if you look at verse 3, He's talking about what all he's given. As the king, he had amassed great wealth. And in, he says, moreover, in my delight in the house of my God, the treasure I have gold and silver, I have given to the house of the Lord. Over and above all that, I've already provided for the holy temple, namely 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of ephor, and 7,000 talents of refined silver. So on and on he goes about the, and this was basically what he had. He then gives the people, uh, if you read on down a little bit, you discover that he's going to give the people the opportunity also to give. Now, this is not tithes. This is free will offerings. And if you'll look in verse 6, then the rulers of the father's household, the princes of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and hundreds, the overseers over the king's work, 
offered willingly. That's the point. And for the service for the house of God, they got 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold and 10,000 talents of silver, 18 talents of brass, 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord. Uh, the people in verse 9, then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly. For they had made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart, and King David also rejoiced greatly. And he, he gives this prayer. Uh, he blessed the Lord. Oh, Lord, you're, you're, you're such greatness and victory and majesty. And then in verse 12, both riches and honor come from you. And you do rule over all. And in your hands is power and might. And it lies in your hand to make people someone great or to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. He says, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you, and from your hand we have given to you, back to you. We are just so, we're just visitors here. We're sojourners uh, before you and tenants as our, all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no hope beyond our, the, our Lord, O oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name, it, is, it comes from your hand. All of it belongs to you. And since I know, O oh my God, uh, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, I in the integrity of my heart have willingly offered all these things so now with joy, I've seen your people who are present here make their offerings willingly to you. So the pattern of giving freely and willingly out of love for the Lord is all through the scripture. It's all, it's Old Testament, New Testament. When, when we read in 1 Corinthians 9 that we're to give willingly out of our own motives and with a cheerful heart, this has long been the precedence. This has always been God's plan. Tithing was not giving. Tithing, of course, was Jewish income tax, and, and offerings were beyond the tithe. These were free will offerings. We see that they gave with a free and willing heart. So whatever you give it, before the Lord, it should be with a free and willing heart. I mean, if it's not... If you feel compelled or manipulated, then you need to check your motives. You know, often we do the same, we do the right thing, but often we do it with wrong motives. And so God wants us to give and he wants us to serve, but he wants us to grow with our, within our motives as we develop. So these motives, would you say we're good? I would think so. I mean, they, and listen, What's remarkable to me is this, all this giving of their own prosperity produced great joy in them. Are you just talking about money? Everything. <laughs> Not money. Okay. Money plus all you have. Not talking about, now, this passage is talking about money. Okay. Yeah, but money's just a symbol of the things that you have. The, I mean, time, talent, spiritual gift, Willingness to serve, willingness to help, uh, giving in grace, money, all kinds of things. Making, making food for people to take home, okay? That's giving. See, I mean, that cost you money, but it wasn't about the money. It was about the gift. And that's what we're going to see with the widow, the widow's mite. She gave the smallest amount, but she gave more than anybody else. So it's not about amounts. It's not about dollar signs or anything like that. It's about what's going on in the heart. Because listen, just like David said, all of it's God's anyway. He just gives you an opportunity to use it properly, to use it for his sake rather than your own. So if you'll turn to Mark chapter 12, We'll look at the widow and what she did and how she so impressed Jesus. 
I mean, the disciples are over there goofing off, talking about who's the greatest. And he interrupted them and called them over to see this lady. Now, chapter 12 is one of the chapters, the whole context here is Jesus warning the disciples and actually confronting the religious leaders with the parable of the vine grower about those who came and killed the owner and the owner's son and the owner's servants, referring to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious Jews. And he, he goes through all of that and... Uh, they, they tested him with questions, and he answered their questions, and they tried to trap him. Uh, you know, verse 13, 14, they came and said, Teacher, we know that you're truthful and defer to no one, uh, for you are not partial to any but teach the way of the God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Of course, this is a trap. If he says, yes, you pay to Caesar, then he's a traitor to the Jews. And if he says no, then he's a traitor to Rome. So they're trying to get him both ways. Of course, he's too smart. And uh, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That's what's going on in this passage. So when we get to this widow and the giving of gifts to the temple, he's looking at all these religious people putting money in the plate. And then he's going to compare them all with the widow. So look at verse 38 through 40. Jesus warns about the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. See, look at their motives. And like respectful greetings in the market, the chief seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets, yet they devour widows' houses and for appearance sake, offer long prayers, and these will receive great condemnation. So rather than actually being givers, the religious Jews in the first century were thieves. They would, they would uh, find somebody that had older parents, and they would tell him that all of his extra money had to go to the temple, the korban and that he couldn't help his parents anymore. And they would figure out ways to steal these people's houses and, quote, do, uh, give them to the church. But in verse 41, it says, he sat down opposite the treasury. He began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury. Many rich, rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins that was literally, the way I'm reading it, two-fifths of a penny. Two-fifths. Oh. Yeah, what were these? These were lepta. Yeah, there's different, there's different numbers you come up with. I don't know exactly what it was. It was less than a penny. Less than a penny. So she comes and puts in two small coins, less than a penny, uh, which amount to a cent, uh, the New American Standards say. And calling his disciples, see, he interrupts them. I'm sure they're overdoing great ministry work. He says to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus or abundance. She, out of her poverty, or out of her, the depths of her poverty, she put in all that she had, all that she owned, all she had to live on. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? Yeah, faith. Faith in, <laughs> faith in God's promise. You literally have to live your life one day at a time with God and know that he's going to send what you need for today. Have you ever been in a place where you had enough for today, just enough for today, and that's all you had, and you realized that it was enough? That the Lord made it clear to you, if you've got enough to get through this day, then you've got enough. 
you got enough because tomorrow when you get up, I'm going to send new mercies. How, how did the mercies come? They're new what? Every morning, every day. The provisions are new every day. Now, here's a question. Are those just words to you? Have you ever actually been in that place where that was how you lived? See, again, here in America, we, we don't think that way. We think, we think about saving. Oh, that's good. I'm not saying we shouldn't save. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that if you have more than you need for today, then that surplus that you have, just like this widow, you need to ask the Lord what it's for. You need to ask the Lord what it's for. And if you tell him, if you say, Lord, this is for my security, then I think you need to check that answer because there's no security in that, not even a little bit. None at all. In right before the World War II, quite a quite a number of Jewish people had saved quite a bit of money. They were business owners and they had money. And listen, in short order, they had nothing. They had nothing, not even their skins. That's how quick things can happen. That's how quick things can change. And the reality that we need to understand as believers is that one day at a time is all we're promised. And that anything beyond that, now there's, there are right ways to handle inheritance. There are right ways to handle excess in your life. And saving is one of those. But I, I wonder if we've not been corrupted in some way by the American idea corrupted mm -hmm. away from the simplicity in Christ of what we actually need to be content and be of service to him. Every person's got to decide that for themselves. So he says in verse 41, he sat down to watch the money being given in the word thereo is an imperfect active indicative, meaning he sat for a while. I mean, he didn't just watch a few. He sat there and watched for a while. Imperfect tense means it's something in the past that goes on. It's continuous action. He, he sat there for a while, you know, and watched them. And he knew who they were. And he knew how much money they had. He began to observe, and he, 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 he was especially uh, observant of the rich. He observed the temple giving at length. He was interested in people's motives for giving, not the amount. Not the amount. He was interested in their motives. And he, again, he looked at the rich. He says they gave large amounts out of their abundance. And, and what that means is this is above and beyond their needs, way above and beyond their needs. They're not going to miss it. It's not something that there's no sacrifice here except from some greater pile, you know, like the rich guy who <laughs> he ran out of room in his barns. So rather than give it to Lazarus, you know, give him a life, he said, well, I'll just build bigger barns. You know, he's just going to, he had treasure laid up where? On the earth. See, that's not what it's for. It's not for that. So these rich people are given large amounts out of their abundance and the widow comes by and gives these two little coins. And Jesus is overwhelmed. Now, look, nobody but Jesus knew her situation, right? I mean, nobody knows what that was all she had. I mean, what could you have bought for less than a penny? I mean, what is it, two sparrows for a penny? She could have bought two sparrows and ate. <laughs> you ever eaten a sparrow? I remember my dad talking about the, the deep, deep part of the Depression where they would eat everything, anything. I mean, if they could catch starlings or sparrows or whatever, they would eat them. And, uh, you know, they would sneak out at night and find them in the trees and throw nets on them just to have food. I mean, that was 
pretty. He said, well, you know, we didn't really think about it. We didn't know we were poor until Roosevelt told us. You know, he just, that's just how they lived. Everybody lived like that. But anyway, this lady comes by and drops her two lepta in the amount, this tiny amount. And Jesus was so impressed that he wanted them to see this. He called them over and said, this widow gave more than all the others. She gave more. And so how do you see that? He said, and of course, he was always using these kind of situations to teach them. And this lesson was important enough to call the disciples to attention because this cuts to the heart of the Christian life. This lady gave everything. She gave everything. So that means she wasn't fearful to be without money. Why is that? Listen, he told his disciples, he had 72 of them, to empty their pockets at the door. And you know, they had to search. What's his name uh, that betrayed him? Judas. They had to search Judas. He had money hidden everywhere. But empty your pockets and go two by two, and I will provide everything you need will be provided as you go. Do you realize that if, you, if we all had to walk out of here today and head somewhere for safety, that everything we would need would be provided as we went? As we went. Someone would stop and give us a ride or give us money or you wouldn't need a work for food sign. Point being... God, God's promise to provide is for real. You never really know that until you get to that place where you need, you know, where God's all you got. There is no other, you don't have the job, you don't have anybody to call, and God's all you got. And that's when you begin to realize that's a, that's a real promise, that he honors that, that you can't, you can't, Stop him from honoring that. He's going to do it. He's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to feed you and water you and clothe you and house you and give you opportunities for relationships and for ministry and service. All these things that are, come, are going to come down the pipe into your life without money. We... We've done all this work on the house. And of course, we've paid out a bit of money to help people, but often we've, it's, been, it's been done for free. Somebody either supported it to do it or people just did the work for nothing. So we're like, wow, you know? And we didn't even ask for that, but God knew what we needed. So he finds a way to do it. Years and years ago, we were... I told Rhonda I wouldn't talk about us, but I, li I lied. I've got to. I, I, I pick on myself all the time. Our car was just going out, just going out. And the next thing you know, somebody called and wanted to give us a car. I'm like, how do you, who calls and gives you their car? And somebody called, and look, we, we've had about four or five cars given to us all down the line. We're like, sure. Bring it over. I'll come get it. Absolutely. Anyway, this lady understood this. This lady lived right on the very edge of having no money. On the very edge. This is where she lived. And every morning she got up and looked to the Lord and said, Father, you know what I need today. And he provided what she needed for that day. Apparently no more. And she was content with that. So content with that that when she went by the plate, she took all, every, all the money out of her purse and put it in there. She didn't worry about it. She had no fear. She was hanging on to nothing of this life as her security. Now, where am I with that? Where am I with that? What if, you, what if your bank account, you, you know, you went home and called up the bank, you know, online, and you discovered that somebody had gotten in and stolen all your money. 
You'd freak a bit, a little bit, I guess. But look, could you could you stop and and understand that you would be just fine? You might be different. Now, is this just talk? What about it, preacher? Is this just talk? It is. It's just talk. <laughs> or is this real? Is this real? They say you can't outgive God. I think that's a good way to say things. Now, he says the rich gave out of their abundance, but the widow gave all she had. And th see, Jesus didn't distinguish about the amounts given. He distinguished as to giving out of abundance and giving all you have. And giving all you have has nothing to do with an amount of money. Okay? It has nothing to do with it. You tell the rich young ruler to sell all you have, give it to the poor. And the guy's like, that's crazy. So if the Lord came to you and said, take every bit you, everything you've got and liquidate it and give it to the poor, give it to a ministry, would you be able to do that? It'd be a challenge, wouldn't it? Surely would. So, wasn't for this lady, and I've heard it said, you know, when you don't have anything, it's easy to think that way. When you got a lot, it's, it, it is more difficult. I don't know that for a fact, but I've just heard that. But I tell you what I do know, I was very, very close friends with a, one of the great contributors to this church, Bruce Russell, and he let me in on the inside of his thinking about money and giving, and Bruce... <laughs> believed he had the gift of giving, and he felt responsible to give. It wasn't, you know, in his big giving every year was camp. You know, we were trying to do camp by grace, and, you know, charging $50 a head. <laughs> and he'd call me every day right as camp was coming up and go, where are we now? I mean, how much money do we have? How much do we need? And... You know, he was trying to, he was negotiating with the Lord, trying to get the number down as low as he, because he believed he was responsible to make up whatever was short. If he had to go take a loan out, he would do that. That's how committed he was to giving to this church. He did the whole upstairs. Didn't cost us a dime, I don't guess. Not one dime. Never said a word about it. Just did it. Hired all the people, did all the work, bought all the materials, walked out, was shining like a new dime, buddy. Really, still great. I mean, you want to talk about a construction job that held together? I mean, that thing is held together great. Anyway, I saw how he was very tight in some ways and very generous in others. When he was dealing with the Lord, he was just, very generous. When he was dealing with his business or anything, he was like, you know, anyway. Christian giving. God has given all of us an abundance of something, and I, I believe this is true. Some of us have an abundance of money, others an abundance of time, an abundance of ability, aptitude, ministry gifting, Whatever God has given in abundance is that which he wants you to give back generously. What God wants is for us to commit all that we are and all that we have to his service. I don't think that as a rule, God wants you to sell all you have and liquidate and live on the street. I don't think that that's the call. It hasn't been for me, but I think he wants you to be willing to do that. You know, Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son, but he had to be willing. He had to be willing, and that was much greater than his money. So imagine having to sacrifice one of your kids. Would you give up your money instead of that? Yes, you would, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Can I take <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not really. No. 
So what has God given you over and above? You're in big trouble, you know that, don't you? Uh, <laughs> this is what he wants you to be generous with. See, you got free time where you, you stay home. I would suggest that he'd want you to spend time in prayer. You got time to make an impact for others that a lot of people don't have. Debbie gets up and goes to work every day to pay her bills. So she's not, you know, she's not has this time to sit down and have long prayers with the Lord. You know, she's catching it in between. So her area of giving is going to be a different area. But what you have an abundance of something. And it may be your gift, it may be your maturity, it may be something that you're aware of that God wants you to be committed all the way. All the way. When you go into the pastorate, you end up as a 24-7 person. It's 24-7. There's no time off. I mean, and you get calls in the middle of the night, somebody's in the hospital, and you got to get up and manage it somehow. you got to get up and go. And, you know, that's a form of giving. That's giving all you have. You know, you have to stop short and take care of your family. Or it would be easy for guys in ministry like Ron or myself, Ernie, to just give everything to that. You just, want to, you just can't stop. You give everything to it. And, you know, the next thing you know it, your family is... Deprived, and that's not good. But, all right, point one, Jesus made a distinction between giving out of excess or abundance and giving all you have. The, the issue is giving what you will not miss, a small part of your abundance. And if that's where your faith is, if that's all the faith that you have and you need the rest of it for security, or pleasure, or whatever you're going to use it for besides him, then that's where you are with the Lord. That's where you are. Giving all you have, this lady gave all the money she had to live on, and I suggest to you that's not all she gave. I bet this lady was available for neighbors and for other people, for her children, for whoever needed her for encouragement, for compassion, to help cook meals, to do whatever needed to be done, this lady was there because this is where she is in her heart and soul with the Lord. See, she's all in, all in. God didn't choose to pour a bunch of money through her, but he chose to, he, he chose to put her in the eternal record, which is pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So she's all in. Here's, that's the point, see? That's the point he's trying to make. It's not the amount of money. It's the, it's the, is it, are you all in? Are you all in? Her faith was not in her money. Is yours? Is your faith in the amount of money you got saved? <laughs> well, I understand, Suzanne. She said, I got none saved. <laughs> I know what you mean. Her faith was in the Lord's promise. We often think of those people who are forced to that place in life where all they have is the Lord. We think of, of them as the poor, the deprived. We, we, we're, we're glad it's not us. But let me tell you, those people, Believers with maturity that go to that place, they are so grateful to be in that place because it frees them from this whole idea of using money as security. You're freed from it. And you can get up and know that tomorrow, you get up and to know that today God's got all you need. And when you get up tomorrow, it's going to be the same thing. <laughs> Listen, that's the life. That's the high life, having a bunch of money that you're dependent. Look, having a bunch of money and not depending on it is great. You can do all kind of wonderful things. That would be a lot of fun. But 
If you depend on it for your security, it's, it's a slavery. You're enslaved to it, you know, and you're always wondering, is it going to last? Is there going to be enough? Is it going to stretch? Are we going to be able to make it? Oh, how's the market doing? You know, are we up or are we down? Secondly, he made a point about giving all you have or the idea of total commitment. Now, there's partial commitment, holding back the rest for yourself. You know, the rich young ruler was willing to follow the rules, but that one area, he, he didn't want it challenged. He didn't want to be challenged in that area. A lot of people that way. I've got dear friends, dear friends of mine that have a bit of money and they're just terrified they're not going to have enough. Just terrified. They, they, whew. and And listen, they know the promises of God as well or better than I do. But those promises are not as real to them as the, as their bank account. And they have put their faith. See, this is the story of the old man belief system. They grew up believing that a large bank account would be security, and that's what the world told them. That's what their dad told them. That's what the financial people tell you, you know. And they grew up believing that having a large amount of money was going to provide them security. So they've put their faith in that. God comes along and says, you don't need that. Be like the birds. You know, we feed them every single day. They're free. They're free to come and go. They don't worry about it all. They know that what they need is going to be there. There's a lot of fear that comes from idolatry by depending on a false object to be your security. Tons of fear. It's a life of fear. You can have it. Those who live right on the edge with God are incredibly blessed to be forced to have that kind of commitment and see God come through day after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and provide what you need in great abundance. It's a great blessing. It's wonderful. Almost makes you want to lose everything. Maybe not, huh? So Jesus talks about laying up treasures on the earth for yourself. Look, if you do that, you're going to lose it all when you're gone. You know, and if the Democrats get back in power, then <laughs> you're probably going to lose it all anyway. Your family might lose it with the death tax, but who knows? All the God's in control of that stuff too. The total commitment has to do with dedicating all of your resources, all kinds of resources, every kind of resource for God's use. What is it that's not available for his use? What do you have within yourself, within your mind, within your heart, within your body, within your possessions that, it, that you don't make available to God? That if he said, I need you to do this, I need you to give that away, you'd go, no. There's your idolatry. You have trusted in that particular thing, and you, you have to have it more than you have to have God. You have to have it. That's a dependence. That's like an addiction. Listen, there are all kinds of addictions. It's just an addiction. You got to have that stuff. So, Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures upon the earth where moth and rust can destroy it and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves cannot break in or steal. Jesus is telling you to take the excess, the abundance that God provides in your life and make it available for his use. It's for his use. Thirdly, God desires that we become those who give all we have. You see, this is 
this is where everything's headed in spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is designed to take us from our self-centeredness, which is the sin nature, which is the old beliefs. See, in the world, the world says, take care of yourself first. You're the most important person. So the sin nature says, hey, I'm the center of everything. I'm the center of my world. God, the, the new man says, God is the center of my world. I say, the old man says, these things belong to me. The new man says, no, they belong to God. He just letting you use them. Just letting you borrow them for a while. You know, just like your body. It don't belong to you. Just like your life. It's God's life. You don't, look, if he took his life out of you, you would just fall apart. I know I would. I'd fall into about 50,000 pieces right here. Be a best to clean up. Now, Matthew 23, 37 says, how, how much are we supposed to love the Lord? With all. All of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, not part of it, not just out of your abundance, right? This is, we're to give all of it to him. Now look, you have to grow into that. You don't start out there, you grow into that. And you grow into that not only through learning the doctrine, but you grow in it through the experiences of the adversities of overcoming them and watching God fight for you and winning the fact that you're still here. You're still rolling after all you've been through. You're still going. Romans 12, 1 and 2, present because of the mercies of God, you're called upon to present your body and soul as a living sacrifice. Body and soul as a living sacrifice. Look, all right, here I am. Use me. Use me. Somebody needs to die. Use me. You know, I've often, you look at young people and little kids that are in death situations and you pray, you know, Father, just take me. I would do that with Rhonda or the kids, you know, take me instead. You need somebody to go, take me. But, you know, the truth of it is, uh, Rhonda would probably fight me to go first, but I've made a deal with the Lord. I'm going first. So, you're welcome to help me along the way if you want. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.4 says, A soldier who is spiritual does not entangle himself in the world. He stays fully committed to his master so that he can please his master. He doesn't get all mixed up. Again, Matthew 6, don't store treasures on the earth, but store them in heaven. And Revelation 3.16 says, don't be lukewarm. You, you make me sick. Jesus said, you make, I'm going to throw you, you make me throw up. All right. Fourthly, giving everything to the Lord requires a total transformation. We start off with our old man belief and behavior system. That's the initial beliefs that we develop as we grow up with self at the center and the primary beneficiary of all the resources we can accumulate. Even what we give away is so that we'll feel good about ourselves. I hear people use that as a legitimate means to, uh, reason to give. You'll feel so good about yourself if you give more than you get. I'm like, yeah, that's true, and that's okay but it has nothing to do with Christian motivation. Christian motivation is given to the Lord. It's given to the Lord. But the old man, if you're still controlled by the old man, I talked to somebody today who's been in the church for quite a while, has all the doctrine you could want, and yet still has faith in many of the wrong things, can't apply dealing with fear about loss, can't, 
can't apply the truth to the situation. Can't do it. And the, the question was, how do I break this hold that this fear has on me? And so we went through exercises and talked about the fact that you've allowed, you know, you believed this idea at one point, and you've allowed it just to build and build and build, so now it's, you've, it's overwhelmed you. And you've got to be able to break that habit. It's just habit. It's, it's faith. It's a habit of faith, habit of belief. So you've got you to teach yourself and show yourself and use the Word of God that you have with yourself before the Lord, with the Lord with you, to break that habit. I call it erase and replace. But, so, but what was amazing, once again, is seeing somebody with so much knowledge who had never been challenged to this point of being able to apply the word to have victory in this circumstance. This person was, was completely defeated, desperate, frantic, panic attack. Now, a good example of using of the old man system was Peter in Matthew 16 where he told the Lord, no, you can't go to Jerusalem. You got to quit saying this stuff. And the point is Peter was trying to use the Lord for his own agenda. Now, Peter loved the Lord, no doubt about it. But Jesus was explaining the plan of God. But in Peter's mind, the plan of God was something very different that was going to serve his needs, was going to provide for Peter. When they heard, you know, they asked him all along, can we sit on your right and left? And all, he said, can you drink the cup? And what'd they say? Oh, sure, of course we can. They don't even know what he's talking about. Still, Peter doesn't even know what he's talking about. Peter's caught up in an old way of thinking that's all about Peter. And listen, that's where we all start. And hopefully we grow out of that, let that go, and become more and more in love with the Lord, devoted to the Lord, committed to the Lord. You know the Greek word in that John 21, I guess it is, with Peter and the Lord. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Agape, agapao, agapao which means to be fully committed. That's to love your Lord your God with all your heart. So it means to be fully committed. Peter says, no, Lord, you know I phileo you, which means I consider you my dearest friend. You're my dear friend. Jesus said, Peter, that's not what I'm really after. I'm after commitment. Are you committed to me? And he goes, see, this is after he'd failed so terribly, and he's like, I don't know if I can do it. So again, they go through it, and finally Jesus really, really hurts Peter when he says, oh, Peter, do you even really just love me as a friend? And he says, you know that I do. But the point being, this is commitment. This is the place in your life where you can give everything to the Lord. All right. The new. Feed my sheep. Yep, that's right. Yeah, I mean, Peter, do, are you committed to me? Are you willing to give your life to do what I sent you to do, to do what I need you to do? Yeah, and Peter's like, gosh, I don't know, Lord. I don't know if I can. Listen, I remember being overwhelmed and afraid about the gift of pastor teacher, thinking, gosh, can I do that? How can I do that? That's so much, so much commitment involved in that. You know, I like to have too much fun. Now, the new man knows happiness is based on the Lord, relationship with the Lord, and that security is based, as, based on the promises of the Lord, not money, not even, not even having a husband or wife or relationship. None of those things are security. All of those things can change in a heartbeat. The new man grows into total love with the Lord, total commitment of the heart. You know, the book of 1 John deals heavily with this. We love because he first loved us. 
The new man also gives out of gratitude for the Lord, appreciation, reciprocation. This is Romans 12, 1, because of the mercies of God, then present your bodies a living sacrifice. Give your body over to be used for God's purpose. Quite a few of those guys in the early days were used as martyrs. They became martyrs. All the disciples, you know, Peter especially, crucified upside down. Fifthly, giving all to the Lord is based on faith in his provisions and love for him. The widow gave all of her money. Why? Because she trusted God for her provision. It was no big deal. I mean, if she'd have had a thousand pennies, she'd have given them all to the Lord. She wasn't worried about it because she knew that the, the mercies would be there the next morning, just like they had been every day of her life, and this they would until it was time to go that that is an absolute fact. God's provision comes daily. 2 Corinthians 8, 1, in, 1 through 5. If you turn with me to that just right quick, and we'll, we'll finish up here. 2 Corinthians 8. I remember years ago we did a big study on that. He's talking about this gift that Paul was putting together from the Gentile churches to take to Jerusalem, and he's in Macedonia, Greece. Fellow believers, I want to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that under a great ordeal of affliction, see, they're under poverty, they're under great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. I testify that according to their ability and even beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, they gave willingly, just like First Chronicles, begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Great, great ministry. Great, great testimony. They gave sacrificially and they gave themselves to the Lord. And that's the key here. This is not about money, guys. It's not about holding on to your money or giving it all away. It's about surrendering your heart to the Lord to be used however he so desires. Matthew 19 talks about those who've given up houses, lands, and family for my sake will be reimbursed a hundredfold in the next life. So this is treasures in heaven. You've given up your treasures on the earth for the Lord's sake, and he's going to reimburse you a hundred times in heaven. Acts 2.45, this is when... Peter had given this great sermon and all these people from all over the world there were there for the uh, festival. What was the name of the festival? Passover. Passover. They were from all over the world. They heard the message, they got saved, and they stayed. They didn't have homes. They didn't have jobs. They stayed. And it cost, yeah, that's right. Oh, this part of the fast, Passover. They were, they were there on their once-a-life pilgrimage and so the, all the all of a sudden the church quadruples in number and many of them don't even have jobs so they begin to liquidate all of their uh, possessions to take care of these people and it's not communism it was those people were in deep need they 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 wanted to stay and get oriented to the christian life before they went back home if they ever went back home so it says they begin selling houses and property to support the new believers in Jerusalem. Finally, giving to the Lord is far more than just giving money, it's giving all. The widow gave her heart, her life, her future, everything she had. The apostles gave everything for the rest of their lives in service to the Lord, making everything God has given you available for his use, your home, your car, your time, your talent, your money, your expertise, everything. That's the goal, and it comes out of growth. So... I hope that's helpful to you, and we'll pray.
finished about three minutes early. Father, I thank you for this, that you've taught these great lessons. You've not only taught it out of the word, but taught it in life. And I pray, Lord, that each of us could be faced with the adversities in life that will cause us to come to know this is for real. That not just an academic understanding to quote verses, but this is something that's real because we've seen you do it. That we know that you honor this promise. I pray that, Father. I ask, I ask that we have that kind of total conviction within ourselves so that we can not only live this, but share it with others with great conviction, with certainty. Yeah, I love you, Father. I praise you in Christ's name. Amen.